This is so exciting. I love MozCon. It's my favorite conference of the year. It's just so cool to be here. Six years ago, I went to MozCon Local, and I sat in the audience way back, pretty hungover, looking up at the stage and said, I want to do that. Dream big, right? I wanted to say hi to everybody here in the audience and everybody on the internet because they can't be with us today. Uh, it's just so amazing to be here, and I'm just really stoked to jump in. It's going to be a deep dive into topic maps, and we're also going to talk a lot about innovation work. Uh, I pitched this idea thinking that I'd come and show you everything that you need to know about building topic maps. TLDR, I'm not done yet, as Tom Kaffer said. Who would have thunk that it would take more time, right? So let's jump in. Doesn't it feel like vacation here in lovely Seattle, walking around, sun, light breeze, hanging out with our Canadian friends telling me just how hot it is when back home in Colorado it's 102 degrees? So this story and this journey for me began on January 4th on the lovely island of Oahu. I was sitting there taking a shower, and I came up with this amazing idea for building a killer product all around topic maps. I had this vision of a force-directed tree. You've probably seen that kind of tool in sight bulb or screaming frog, and I thought, this will be amazing. And that was the beginning of the journey, which a lot of times I think of innovation work as being a journey into the great unknown. And that's really what we're talking about. So vacation for me is reading, catching up on all kinds of articles. I read this killer article by my pal Dan Leapson, which is all about how local SEO guide earns their knowledge. And it's an amazing article. I've got a great resource uh, webpage, which you'll see the link in a couple minutes, and I strongly encourage you to read that article. And this deck is my journey to earn knowledge around topic clustering. And part of this story is not just about innovation work, and it's not about topics, it's also about careers. And I'm going to touch on that and settle along the way in a couple moments, because I think it's teachable stuff for anybody doing any kind of work in SEO. Whether you do content, whether you do technical, whether you do e-com, there's lessons for everybody along the way. Okay, so I'm in Hawaii and I think to myself, what a great year 2021 was. We built this product called Explorer. It's amazing because it allows you to start with your Google Search Console data and it, and it allows you to store 50,000 rows of data per day. But the, the really challenging part about it is what if we're on a website where we don't have any kind of keyword footprint in a new topic area? Or what if I, as an SEO, have no experience working in an area? It was clear to me that we'd only solve some of the problems, right? So that's why we're di digging into topic, topic stuff. So I started to think about topic clustering and the technologies behind it, and I got really, really stoked, and I started to talk to a lot of my close friends. Dave Sotomano, Robin Lord, John Murch, all the guys who are building, and also some, just all kinds of people who are building just the coolest stuff on the cutting edge of SEO. Because when you're starting these journeys, I always like to talk to these folks because they have uh, done a lot of the hard work already, and there's a lot of uh, opportunities for me to save pain along the way. And I knew that it was critically important because building content, as we all know, is hard. And it takes a lot of time, and it's really, really tough, especially when you have no data. So what are we really talking about? We're talking about topics. You can get a sense here. Topics are the things that are made up of lots and lots of keywords, right? A topic is the subject. It's the thing that we're talking about. Whereas keywords are kind of like the important words that we use to talk about the subject. The topic is the thing. That's the thing that I was really, really intrigued by. Grab this bit.ly. Um, I built a whole bunch of free tools, and you get to play with them. And I really, really want your feedback. Um, and my Twitter handle's there, so please at me or DM me. Okay, so here's what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about client goals first. I hope in your onboarding that you ask lots of great questions like this. Who's your ideal customer? What services do you offer? What is most profitable? We want to market the things that make people money, right? Um, what's a conversion worth? We need to know every single time when they close a deal how much money they're going to make. How, when, where do you make your money? 
what questions are tied to conversions? What are those, those kind of like hinge points that make people say yes or no? Um, we also want to know, and this, I got to call out my friend Renee Bigelow. She said this to me once, and it just blew my mind because it was like, I thought about content from a traffic perspective, and I know publishers, they have very different problems than what we're attacking today, but really it's like when you're getting started, it's talking about content to support your sales process. Gathering of the data. This is what gets me super, super excited because I love building tools, right? And here's my first principle. When I was thinking about uh, building out topic maps, the first thing that I thought was, if I can build topic the way that Google understands knowledge, then my content is more likely to rank than not. So what do we actually know? We don't know what Google knows. We can't see inside the black box. So all we can know is what they show us. And they show us information or how things are related in a couple of different places that are really cool. And we're going to stop on some of them and go really deep into Google Trends. Uh, so they tell us lots of information through the Knowledge Graph Search API. One of the free tools that you can play with is a way to actually interact with the Knowledge Graph Search API, which I think is really fun. Great information in the SERPs, as we all know. Autocomplete, which is really powerful, but I'll give some reasons why I didn't settle there as we go. Keyword planner data, which I am not going to do a lot on today, and that's going to be an area of deep research for me throughout the summer and fall. And then Google Trends, which really rocked my world. Okay, so first, Knowledge Graph Search API. Uh, super cool. You can type in any kind of search term, and then Google will respond. The tool that I built, it'll show you all of the things that are related to your head term. In this case, it was bicycle. And then it'll show you information in that article body co uh, column, and it'll also show you what the source of data is. This is why it's important to go deep and to look where your data is coming from because you'll start to see things like Wikidata and Wikipedia making up an enormous amount of Google's knowledge, right? You're also going to see things that you're going to have to pay attention for because you'll have to disambiguate against them later. And that's like to make, make it clear for Google so that they understand what you're writing about and what's maybe potentially related, but that we don't want to write about. Like if I'm writing about bikes, I don't want to write about motorcycles. Okay, Wikipedia. Why is it important? Wikipedia makes up 67% of the trusted sources for knowledge panels this month. If I want to know things, and I think Google is tapping into like different sources for data, I'm probably going to want to start in Wikipedia. So I went deep into Wikipedia. First couple of things that jump off the page. Look at all the blue, right? Those are all of the related topics to the term on the page. I was like, that's so cool. Look at the top of the page. This is really neat too, because there's a section called disambiguation. On every single page in Wikipedia, they have uh, links to another page that tells search engines and users what we are talking about, which is bicycle, a pedal-driven two-wheel vehicle, but we're not talking about uh, bicycle crunch, we're not talking about bicycle kicks, and we're not talking about a playing card corporation. At the bottom of the page, you're going to see these really cool purple accordions, and if you were to open those up, you'll see all kinds of really cool things that are all related to your topic. There's a link in the resource deck for Google Sheets add-on, so you can get all of the inbound links, outbound links, mutual links between Wikipedia pages and Wikidata. It's, it's really cool. Install that. Put it in Google Sheets. You'll love it. Okay. Tons of information in the SERPs, right? Uh, we've got related searches. We've got people also ask. I like to put a search into Google on a desktop, scroll to the bottom of the page, click in, and then I get this cool view that I can screenshot. I also got related entities in the bottom right. That's pretty cool. When I started to think about building a topic clustering tool, I assumed I was going to use the search results pages as my main data source. And a lot of people who are building tools, like Keyword Insights, for example, they're using, uh, they're using the SERPs as their data source. But as we'll get into, that's a lot of work. And that's why I got really into Google Trends. Autocomplete, super powerful. 
I think we all know what it is. You type in and it gives you up to 10 results. The thing that jumped off the page at me when I started to play with this and tools that are built on top of it, like keyword sheeter, uh, is that the data is super noisy and it's also super localized. If you're working in local SEO and you want to do keyword research at scale and you want tons of ideation, I think autocomplete is super interesting. If you want to build knowledge around an entire keyword space, probably you'll find that the data is too noisy to work with. This is what really jumped off the page at me, uh, just how personalized it is based on the language, location, and past user history. And look at the bottom how Google, in their own documentation, is comparing autocomplete to Google Trends. And when I saw that, I started to get really giddy because I love Google Trends. And I love building tools. And last year, I built a Google Trends API so I could play with uh, Google Trends data. And I built it because I was like, really wanted to build something for Lily Ray so that she could do stuff with news data. <laughs> and so I had this tool on my shelf, sort of like a hammer that I was just like waiting to grab and start whacking stuff. Okay, so let's see just how tough working with manual is, right? Let's say we enter a query. You can update the region from country to region or state or city or DMA. You can change your time range and also the category. And then you could like download the related topics and then you could add those to a Google Sheet and... Man, that would stink, wouldn't it, to have to like try and do something at scale? Um, so for me, I got really excited because I knew that I could get that data via APIs. If you're like dorky and you like using Python, ew, uh, you could use something called PyTrends. And if you are into JavaScript, you could use something called Google Trends API. Or if you like AppScript, you could use a data provider like Data for SEO to get this kind of information. And I subscribe when I'm building products to a philosophy called make it work, make it right, and make it fast. And I got that from my pal John Merch. I think it's super, super cool. So when I'm building tools, I always start with the Google Sheets interface, and then I use AppScript to get rolling, and then if I have to get more complex, I do that. In this interface, you can see how we can put the bicycle as a search term, the dates, the categories. You can see how there's a city whitelist that column, it's column K, that means that there's also a city exclusion list, which means I'm excluding all of the cities in the United States that have at least 1,000 residents. So I get rid of any kind of localization in my data, and it's all just like going deep, deep, deep into bicycles. The L column is stop words. That's like big box stores, some brands, some city names, disambiguation. Do you remember when we looked at, at Wikipedia, we saw... Bicycle Corporation and Motorized Bicycles. Well, I might want to put in mopeds, motor, you know, all kinds of stuff that I know is going to take my tool off, off, off course. Okay. So with Google Trends, there's a bunch of different ways of getting data out of the API. You can get interest over time. In almost every SEO deck that you've seen ever, it's almost always interest over time. That's that time series chart. You can also get interest by location. You can also get daily trends. You can also get uh, related trends, related topics, and related queries. You would think, since this is a thing about uh, topic clusters, that we'd be working with related topics. But through a lot of experimentation, I came to the um, belief that related topics was too noisy. What do I mean by too noisy? Like, lots of people, brands, corporations, it didn't tell me about bikes, but it told me about all kinds of stuff that would take me off course and out of my main topic. So I settled on related queries. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to get data. We're going to use, uh, we're going to personally monitor it, you know, human inter intervention or human curation during the make it work phase. And we're going to remove irrelevant terms. And you'll see why that's important in just a second. And then we enrich the data with you know, another API that might give us things like search volume and it might give us cost per click. And you also can get intent, which is really, really cool because you can use it to filter your data down the road, right? And then you turn that process multiple, multiple times. All right, human curation is really important and here's why. Let's say we start with bicycle. 
I love this. This is my world. I know all about this keyword space. Check it out. Look at about 12 o'clock. Do you see how it says Trek Bicycle? You'll also notice this whole way of visualizing the data is called a radial tree cluster, and it's from the D3 library. Part of going deep is learning about all the visualization libraries that I could use to potentially tell a story with the data. Because down the road, end users are going to have to look at this and say like, oh, what does this mean? What does this mean? So radial tree cluster was really interesting at first, but like after two cycles, this data is getting really useful. Oh, the reason why Trek is important here is that let's say I feed Trek in, the next turn of the cycle could very well turn into Star Trek. And then the next one after that is Jean-Luc Picard. And now we're not talking about bicycles anymore. So that's why human curation early is really important. So after two turns of the cycle, it's really interesting, right? We're up to 139 search terms. This whole process has taken me three minutes to build in terms of like running the tool. The visualization is really cool. It's clustering. I get to see how things are related to each other. I've got search volumes. It's pretty interesting. One more turn. Check this out. We're around 1,000 search terms. Do you see how the visualization is becoming less efficient? So this is what you learn when you go deep. You learn what you can do and what you can't do, right? So within 15 minutes of doing that manual curation and running the cycle a whole bunch of times, you get to build something completely, oh my God. That's awful, right? <laughs> Pump your brakes, yo. Uh, 4,000 search terms equals messy, messy, messy data viz. I could never do analysis that way. That would totally bum me out. That would be a total fail for a tool. Um, which takes us into analysis. This is when we've gathered all our 4,000 terms and we need to like make lots of decisions. This is a force directed tree. This is what I envisioned building. I was standing in the shower and I was like, oh, the different sizes of the nodes will be meaningful. The different colors, it'll be meaningful. People will be able to make decisions, it'll be awesome. 10, 15, 20 hours of experimentation big hot steaming pile of poo. Couldn't get it to work. Circle packing. This is another D3 library. Much closer. Really interesting. I can get a sense of scale. I can see big topics, smaller topics. I get search volume, right? Really interesting. There's different ways of interacting with the data. So you could click into one thing and it'll zoom right into that, which is really interesting. Wasn't quite there yet. This though, rocked my world. Okay, brief segue into careers. So I love hanging out with SEOs. And I love talking to really smart people because I know that there are things that I don't know, right? And I talked to probably 50 SEOs before MozCon to show them this because I was so excited about it. And if you do one thing in that resource library, look for the Noah's Sunburst tool and please follow the link and play with it. And please give me feedback because I think it's almost addictively fun to play with. Um, and down below, there's, there's like a table. And what's really cool about this is that as the user clicks into a segment, it zooms in. So like on the left, if the user had clicked uh, Trek Bicycles, it would have zoomed into the Trek Bicycle term. The size of the arc tells you how much search volume is downstream that's related to that topic. So for that term bicycle in the center, the stuff in the inner ring are all of the search terms that are related to it. And I got really, really interested in this because remember I showed you how we went from 1 to 22 to 139? That was like five or six different API calls. That is such a simple technical solution. And to me, that was like really, really, really interesting. Here's a question. Let's say you're talking to someone who's not technical. Let's say you're talking to decision makers in a meeting. Do you think you could get buy-in with a really visual tool like that? And you could play with it and interact with the data. Uh, or let's say you're in a sales meeting and you're just, you walk in and you're showing people their entire keyword universe. Do you think that that would blow them away potentially? Maybe, maybe not. I think it's pretty cool. Okay, what I found building tools is that there seems to be two or many more flavors of how SEOs interact with data. I like spreadsheets. You know, 
Paul Shapiro sees music when he looks at a spreadsheet. David Mim sees music when he looks at a spreadsheet. But there's a whole cast of characters who when they look at that, they see things just swimming around the page. And that user group, when I showed them the sunburst, were like, oh my God. It was like Joker smile. It totally worked. So most SEOs might prefer something like this, especially if it has Moz colors. Um, this is a Data Studio template that I built for this. I thought it was really fun. Okay, so what are we seeing? We're going to jump in in a second. And I'll, I'll go deeper into this. But uh, okay, so clustering methods. A couple things. How do we do it? How do we cluster things? You could do it manually. I think the goal, for me anyway, was to get away from that as quickly as possible. One use that's really interesting, though, is Keyword Planner. That interface is really, really cool. And very quickly, you can filter down. Let's say, uh, well, Nico is a guy that I work with. He's amazing, totally brilliant, super analytical, a great PPC mind. Uh, what he'll do is throw 1 to 10 search terms into Keyword Planner, comes back with 1 to 10,000 different terms, and he uses the filtering mechanism over on the right, and then he'll add each of those different sets of terms into their own ad groups, download the campaigns, delegate the workout to the team, boom, topic maps. I thought that's pretty cool. SERP similarity is the gold standard right now. That's when you, let's say you have a bucket of 10,000 keywords, you feed each one into a data provider like data for SEO or GrepWord, something like that. And it'll come back with a JSON response of everything that's happening on that page. So the top 100, the related, all of the SERP features, et cetera. And then the way that we're getting to our clusters is you basically compare the results of the different terms, and then you very quickly have a sense of how they should be clustered based on the similarity of the responses. The engineering challenges are significant, which is why I didn't finish the tool. And the costs are significant. If you have 10,000 different things, you have to make 10,000 API calls. And then you have to store all that data, process all that data, analyze all that data. And it has to be a really robust system when you have 10,000 API calls. You can also use machine learning. This is a resource that I kind of updated a little bit. That's, that's in the guide also. Um, super cool, really fun. This is how it works. You feed it a CSV as search data. It'll then come up with clusters. It's about 60 to 70% of the way there. We felt like after we did a lot of experimentation that it was close, not quite, but if you modified it in certain ways, we could get over 90% of the data to cluster. Um, but I like Occam's razor approaches. This is where we get into career stuff again. I love leaning into folks' lessons that they're willing to share with me. It saves me hours and hours and hours of time. If you don't have a board of advisors for whatever your superpower is, go get one. Get a network. Work your tail off to build a network. I'm super stoked to be in your network. At me on Twitter. Come say hi. I'll do a Zoom with you. Elias Dabas. He is like one of the coolest guys working in SEO. Um, he built the Advert Tools library. We had a couple meetings, and we looked at how we could potentially cluster the data using regular expressions instead. So it's like much simpler than doing lots of machine learning. And we came up with a solution whereby you could take all the search data, come up with all these predefined buckets. Remember how I said we could get intent via API? Well, this gets us down into sub-intent, which I think is pretty cool. Bottom line, you got to find your own way. For me, data analysis equals data studio, right? Let's get back to that template. Let's get through it. Uh, so clusters on the left, driven by Lee Foote's tool. Intent, oh, sorry, clusters on the left, and then we get all the queries in each cluster. I got search volume that came via API. And then I also have intent via API, subintent via that like regular expressions driven tool. And then we can do all kinds of cool analysis on our data, right? Like uh, that whole tool was focused on getting trends data. Well, what if we compare our trends data versus the 300 or 700,000 search terms that we're storing up in our data warehouse? You guys are storing your Search Console data, right? No? You got to. There's so much data there. Anyway, so you can compare the two. Uh, the SQL to perform this analysis is in the resource deck, so you can do it yourself. 
And what you're going to find is that there are gaps, even if you only have 4,000 in trends and 400,000 in search console, which means that there's plenty of opportunities for you. Doing that analysis is so easy in a tool called Count. If you don't know SQL and you want a really gentle way to get into it, I think Count is super, super fun. You can also compare trends in Search Console to find that overlap. And that means that our template's going to change a little bit to do analysis. All of a sudden, we get position bucketing, right, which is super useful. So you can find low-hanging fruit, stuff I'm on the first page, stuff that's aspirational. Talking with J.R. Oaks about all this stuff that I was building, he gave me the aspirational thing. I think it's awesome. Okay, creating topics, real easy, right? Uh, you basically, let's get back to our client goals for a second. We need to have that as a filter to think about this next step. Everything has to align with our client goals. Things have to have a high search volume, right? So that there's a meaningful opportunity. I know publishers have a different goal. They just want their ad revenue. But for most of us, we want conversion intent. And we have to have a reasonable chance of ranking for things. And that's the process. We also want to go back to our sunburst, right, for ideas. Because then we can think about how to build our internal links that map the same way that our topics are related via Google Trends, which I thought was really cool. It's a neat, neat kind of hack. Okay, so what's next? Then we get into our normal kind of like publishing flow. Build content briefs using all kinds of killer tools, whether it's Content Harmony, Market Muse, ClearScope, whatever. Publish your content, and then you get to use Search Console data to refresh and optimize. Cool. You gotta earn it. You gotta go deep. Uh, whatever it is that you do, whatever your superpower is, this is something I've been thinking a lot about. Like, uh, I spoke at Search Love a couple weeks ago, and I was really meticulous about masking. There were three of us there at that conference who had masks on, and I got COVID, and it was a super bummer. And I was lying in bed for 10 days, and I was thinking about my deck, and I was thinking about my deck, and thinking about my deck. And I was really concerned that I'd get up on stage here and just cough my ass off in front of you guys. And I started to think about what's really, really important Really, really important. And I thought a lot about my friend Hamlet Batista, who passed away last year from COVID. And uh, the last chat that I had with him, I asked him, like, hey, what, what was the most meaningful thing that turned your career? And for him, he didn't hesitate at all. It was give, 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 give. If you have an opportunity to do that, go above and beyond. You will be shocked how fast the karmic wheel spins in your direction. Uh, be curious. Ask why. Ask what if. And then test it. Um, guys, this has been a, a hoot. I don't want to like give you too much career advice or anything like that. It's just I didn't know if I'd ever have a chance to do this again. You know, to be in a stage like this and to try and share what's been meaningful to me because this whole concept of giving and trying and growing a network, being bold, dreaming big and believing in yourself has totally propelled my career. And I think it's totally repeatable. And that if you kind of embrace that mentality of openness and caring and giving, you'll be shocked how powerful it is. Thanks, everybody. I really, really appreciate it.